I... Be great for one day. I imagine okay. I will do the whole thing in Be English and we'll simply move over. Let's start off in English. Be no? Be <laughs> okay. Welcome to everybody. It's a, it's, it's a pleasure to see you all here. This is the first of two seminars to be given by, by our guest. The Professor Sidney Griffith is here through the generosity of the Nechemiel Levtzion Center for Islamic Studies and the Center for the Study of Christianity, who are co-sponsoring these seminars. Professor Griffith has already given lecture in memory of Professor Chavalat Rusiafe uh, two days ago on Sunday, and now we're into a series of two seminars. It's also an opportunity to essentially combine forces, and this seminar is also serving essentially as a seminar <coughs> of the study uh, of the MA program and the study of late, of late antiquity. Professor Zev Weiss and I teach that seminar, and it's a pleasure to see our students here, and our students outnumbered. I, I thought we might outnumber the other group, but no chance. It's <laughs> quite a crowd, and it's very good to see. Professor Sidney Griffith needs no introduction, certainly not for me, but you'll get one anyway. How's that? A little bit of one, a <laughs> short introduction. Um, not only because Professor Griffith needs no introduction to everybody in this room, but to introduce someone who's essentially coming home in so many respects mm -hmm. also seems a bit funny. And I, I think by this time, I, I certainly hope that Sidney feels as home here in Jerusalem as he does anywhere else. Uh, Professor Griffith has been here uh, twice at the Institute for Advanced Study. He's been at the Hebrew University on numerous other occasions. And I think for many of us in the room, it's become a frequent and always pleasurable interaction over the years. And as I said, very much a home. Uh, professor Griffith is the ordinary professor emeritus in the Department of Semitic and Egyptian Languages and Literatures in the School of Arts and Sciences at the Catholic University of America, where he also earned his doctoral degree. and uh, and essentially raised a generation and maybe beyond a generation of students, both locally and at other institutions around the world, in those fields which are his, the study of Arabic Christianity, aspects of Syriac monasticism, medieval Christian Muslim encounters, and varied aspects of ecumenical and interfaith dialogue which derive from those different areas. His many publications will not be rehearsed now, mainly because I will make numerous errors in pronunciation, if not beyond that. And they're not ready to be revealed at this point uh, for the imposter I am. So let me simply mention, okay, your last two books, The Church in the Shadow of the Mosque, Christians and Muslims in the World of Islam, and the Bible in Arabic, the scriptures of the people of the book in the language of the in the language of Islam, both of which appeared, one in 2008, the most recent in 2013, from Princeton University Press. Sydney, it's a pleasure, it really is a pleasure to have you with us, pleasure renewed. And Professor Griffith will speak with us today on It Only Seemed So to Them, Docetism and the Contextual Reading of the Quran for 157. Yeah, it's in your hands. Well, thank you very much, David, for your kind words, and thank you, everybody, for uh, coming to join us in this seminar today. Can you hear me in the back? Yeah? Okay, very good. Please we just... We are young. <laughs> what? We are young. Oh, that's right, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so please, uh, if uh, my voice goes down or anything like that, please just wave, and uh, I'll do my best... Uh, to be heard. I'd like to say at the outset that my idea of a seminar is that it's a participated phenomenon. It doesn't envision one person simply speaking for the entire time, but like most professors, I probably can be accused of liking the sound of my own voice, and it might seem to you that I'm not ready to pause or anything like that, but I really am, and I sincerely hope that at any point you have a question or a comment, you won't hesitate to just signal that you'd like to have a word. Uh, that way we can uh, 
be sure to be as participative as possible. Um, I think the matter that we uh, will be discussing uh, will be interesting from a number of perspectives, and it's material that lends itself to numerous approaches and different interpretations and different hypotheses about what is meant and where it came from and things of that sort. So uh, from me, you will be hearing my uh, own take on things, but I, I welcome and hope that you will uh, be as uh, combative as you like, because my thinking can only grow if somebody questions it. So without further ado, I, I learned from uh, David that uh, the course of which this seminar is part uh, is focused on late antiquity. And of course, most of us who work in the world of early Islam are busily these days thinking of our inquiry as being uh, a historical one, uh, very much into late antiquity, thinking that uh, the life and career of Muhammad and the appearance of uh, the Quran, that both of these things are um, part of late antiquity. And of course, this always begs the question of, well, what on earth is late antiquity? Um, you know, sometimes one might think that it's a way of avoiding saying the early Christian period, or it's uh, late Roman history, or what have you, but probably most people think of it as a, a Greek or Latin phenomenon, maybe bringing in some Syriac or some uh, Jewish Aramaic, but for a very long time it was a stretch for many scholars to think of it as reaching into the first third of the seventh century and encompassing uh, Arabic uh, speaking milieu and in fact the first Arabic book, namely the Quran. So uh, owning that idea that Islam, the Quran, Muhammad, all belong to late antiquity, um, what does it sort of imply? Uh, it seems to me that it implies that we can expect to see in the Quran and hear in the Quran uh, echoes of things that we otherwise are familiar with uh, only from Greek or maybe Aramaic uh, or other language communities uh, prior to the 7th century. And as we look at the Quran itself, just uh, even in a very cursory fashion, one of the things that we uh, come to realize very quickly is that it's a book that has uh, a lot to do uh, with Jews and Christians and their scriptures, uh, but in a very unaccustomed way. And that unaccustomed way, of course, is what provides us scholars with lots to <coughs> hypothesize about and lots to uh, talk about. Because there are virtually no quotations from the Bible uh, in the Quran. I like often to say that uh, the Bible is everywhere in the Quran, but simultaneously it's nowhere in the Quran if you're looking for quotations. Uh, there is the quotation of a half of a song verse uh, in one place, and in other places the language comes very close to evoking passages uh, in the Bible, one from the New Testament, for example, that uh, speaks of a camel going through the eye of the needle. But otherwise, there are virtually no quotations, but there are lots of recollections of stories about uh, biblical patriarchs and prophets. And these recollections often turn out uh, to reflect not just material that we can find in the Bible, but often material that otherwise we find not in biblical texts at all, but in apocryphal works or 
Second Temple uh, Jewish writings or apocryphal early Christian texts. Um, so the matter becomes uh, quite complicated sometimes, especially when we realize that the Quran seems to presume that its audience is already familiar with uh, the stories of uh, the patriarchs and prophets. And not only that, uh, the Quran often uh, recalls the patriarchs and the prophets uh, in language that is very reminiscent of language we find in other places. For example, especially in Syriac texts, but not only Syriac texts, and especially in Syriac Memre, which, as you may know, uh, are longish liturgical compositions written by such individuals as Ephraim the Syrian, Jacob of Sarug, uh, Narsai of Nisibis. I'm assuming these are all household names, right? <laughs> anyway, uh, we, we have Memre, or uh, sort of homiletic texts that exist in hundreds of lines in many instances that similarly recall the stories of the patriarchs and prophets and other biblical ecclesiastical Jewish figures. And of course, these Christian writers are putting a different construction upon these stories than the construction we would find put upon them in the Quran. Uh, in fact, in my view, the Quran has its own uh, very distinct paradigm uh, under which or with reference to which it in fact recalls the stories of patriarchs and prophets. So um, as uh, we talk about these matters today, I thought that rather than just go on at great length about um, how it is that we can see uh, the Quran as a piece of religious literature that seems on the surface to be well aware of the religious currents of discourse uh, in the first third of the seventh century, that it would be useful to, to look at a particular instance in uh, the Quran's text, a one that is fraught with all sorts of difficulties in understanding and interpretation and just go from there, like moving from the concrete to the more abstract or uh, the more general. So uh, to help us uh, in this enterprise, I, I chose to focus on a particularly difficult passage or verse uh, that comes from um, Surah 4 or Surah Tanisa uh, in the Quran. And I'm hoping that by now everybody will have in hand uh, two uh, handouts, two pages, uh, one of which is a two-pager, but it's printed on two sides. Um, and the other is a, a longish translation of a number of verses from Surah 4. Perhaps we can pause a moment and just see if everybody has access to here a ton. I think I this is one we can turn and what is two sided, one is only one side yeah. of the page. And one is an outline of the contents of Surah 4, and the other is a, uh, a translation of a number of verses. Uh, let me say just a few words about um, the Surah in general. Uh, surah 4 is one of the longer surahs in the Quran. It comes from the so-called uh, Medinan period, excuse me, 
of, uh, of Muhammad's active uh, career. And you may recall from your studies that um, Muhammad began his religious career somewhere around the year 610, uh, so the very beginnings of the 7th century. And in the year 622, uh, he moved his, well, he simply moved uh, from the city of Mecca, where he began his uh, mission, if we could call it that, uh, to the city of Yathrib, which subsequently got the name Medina, but Medina Tathnabi, the, the city of the prophet, uh, later on. It wasn't called that uh, in his day. Um, anyway, the, uh, the Meccan surahs, or those of the 114 surahs that go to make up the Quran, uh, seem to come from the time that Muhammad spent in Medina, and to reflect his career there, his difficulties there, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, so if we look at the outline that you should have by now in front of you, uh, the one that has uh, two pages, uh, two-sided uh, handout, on, they're both on one single sheet, this is my very rough outline of uh, the surah, because I think it's important methodologically when we want to uh, focus our attention more specifically on a particular passage, it's important to locate that passage within the general context of the surah in which it appears. Um, this has not always happened in Western Quran scholarship, or for that matter, in Muslim Quran scholarship, the idea of uh, sort of cherry picking uh, uh, proof texts from here and there in the Quran has an honorable or perhaps dishonorable history in uh, both uh, Muslim and uh, Western non Muslim uh, Quran scholarship. So I think it's important for us to have a sense now of the larger context of the verses we want to look at. So you'll notice at the top that according to uh, many Quran scholars, uh, this Surah Tanisa comes from uh, year four or five in uh, the Prophet's career in Medina as he assumes leadership of the community there. And the community, of course, included not only his followers, <coughs> people who were sympathetic to him, but also other people unsympathetic to him, uh, many of whom seem to have worked against his uh, enterprise there. And as we just look at uh, the contents, I won't go through them in uh, great detail, uh, because people can do that on their own. Um, but I would like just to look at the major headings you see there. Um, the first one that I call moral directives and behavioral admonitions, that's my language. And I think <coughs> that from verses 1 or verse uh, 2 to verse 43, you know, we have just... Uh, sort of a collection of things that concern uh, life uh, under the guidance uh, of Muhammad in, in Yathrib at this time. What to do with orphans? Uh, are there any special rules for women and children? What about inheritance? Personal conduct, rules from prayers, things like this sort of thing can seem fairly disparate. And indeed it is fairly disparate because it seems that this language came to Muhammad on the occasion of specific difficulties arising to which he had to respond. And uh, so once we get through the first 40-some verses, uh, we come to advice that seems to come from God to Muhammad himself and to his community. 
And as one would read these verses that go from verse 41 to verse 152, one always has to be paying attention to uh, the pronouns, uh, especially the second person pronouns, uh, particularly the second person masculine singular, which gives us an indication that the words are being addressed to Muhammad himself, who of course is the one giving voice to them, but he seems to have had the consciousness that these words weren't his, but were being addressed to him, or through him to his community, the people who were associated with him, who followed him, or who heard him, or some of whom were opposed to him. And these are evident when you see the second person uh, masculine plural, usually. And sometimes you can wind up being puzzled <laughs> uh, within all of this. But uh, at any rate, it's in uh, this passage, uh, this uh, s uh, second uh, passage of advice to the messenger and his communities, that we see that he's beginning uh, to have issues uh, with uh, the notion of scripture. You'll notice the recurrence of the word uh, al-kitab here. Uh, he seems to think of himself as delivering words from a kitab, but he's also conscious that the people whom he's addressing are in possession of a kitab. And as we look, uh, we see that he's speaking uh, of uh, Jews in particular uh, in this passage. So the thing that I would want us to, to notice here is that already uh, Jews are coming up as a point of reference uh, for Muhammad. Uh, as a people with whom he's involved, one way or another, uh, we'll be coming to see that he has a considerable amount of criticism uh, to level at the Jewish community. And uh, this is both for religious reasons, as we will see from his perspective, but also it's important to keep in mind the political dimension. Of, of life in Yathrib as he's attempting to govern uh, this particular polity made up of people who were already there before him and had settled interests there. And that seems to have been the case particularly uh, with the Jewish communities there uh, who were there in at least several tribal organizations. So we see this coming up already um, uh, in these verses 44 to 152, and the reference to the uh, kitab, of course. But in addition uh, to scripture people, or ahl kitab, he also seems to be having problems with uh, people who uh, are, in his view, somewhat insincere about joining his movement. They seem uh, to be some days uh, all for it and other days unwilling to invest their money or their persons or their time in advancing the cause. So these are people whom the Quran calls monafikin, uh, uh, hypocrites. So uh, he addresses them as well. Well, uh, not to linger over all of this, because that's not where our primary interest lies, but we come to the third major section, which is basically at the end of the surah, and uh, a whole section from verses 153 to 175 uh, involves uh, the Ahl Kitab. Um, I prefer to translate this phrase as scripture people. Um, I know that for many English speakers, at least, it's common to translate it as people of the book. I don't consider that to be wrong, but it may not 
necessarily cause people to remember that the book in discussion or in reference uh, is usually a scripture or the Bible or the Torah or the Injil, the Gospel or the Zabur, the Psalms. Anyway, uh, the Al-Hitab. Primarily, it seems to me, and certainly in this surah, they are Jews and Christians. And in this surah, uh, the predominant concern seems to be with Jews, people who are Jews. But we'll see, but not linger on it, toward the end, uh, beginning around verse 171, uh, Christians come to be the focus of the concern. Because Muhammad and his teaching is uh, at variance with uh, the beliefs and practices of Jews, as well as of Christians. But it's the passage that has to do with the Jews that is our particular focus because it is within this framework that there appears this uh, crux interpretum, if I could put it that way. Uh, the passage that on the face of it seems to some readers uh, to deny that uh, Jesus of Nazareth died on the cross or that he was crucified, that he was killed or crucified and specifically that Jews had anything to do with it. But uh, we'll see that the Quran text says one thing about this phenomenon, but then <coughs> Islamic interpretive tradition coming after the Quran has a little more to say about it that uh, brings the passage into another whole frame of reference, uh, which I hope I, or I should say, which I hope we uh, can see. Um, so, before I go into this passage, I'm already painfully aware that the only body, only person talking here so far is my good self. So, um, does somebody else have something they'd like to say, maybe corrective, or, uh, before we move on? You know, it's almost impossible that a whole room of people are completely <laughs> convinced. All right. Uh, so, uh, let's come to the to the to the passage itself. Uh, now, uh, these are uh, verses one fifty three, uh, all the way to one sixty two, and. Here is uh, what the Quran through Muhammad has to say about uh, those people of the book or those scripture people who are Jews. Um, I want to say just by way of beginning that uh, it's my view, and this may be not everyone's, that the Quran refers to the sons of Israel, B'nai Israel, uh, when it intends to refer to uh, observers of the Torah before the time of the prophet himself um, and before the time of Jesus uh, because the Quran envisions Jesus as saying that he was sent to the B'nai Yisrael, uh, Israel, you, know, you know what I mean, uh, in order to uh, recall them to the observance of the Torah uh, delivered via Moses and to confirm uh, what uh, scripture came before it, that is the Quran. I take it that when the uh, Quran refers to Jews, Yahud, not the Nei Israel, or those who practice Judaism, as one phrase is sometimes translated, uh, 
he's referring, or the text is referring, to uh, Jews of Jesus' time and after. And uh, among, and another group of the Bnei Yisrael are people whom the text calls Nasara. Uh, now, some people may find this view contentious, but okay. Um, and I think that that word means Nazarenes, and that it, they re, that it refers to the followers of Jesus of Nazareth, the Nazarene, as the text often calls him. And uh, his followers are referred to in the New Testament as uh, as Nazarenes only once that I know of, and that's in the Acts of the Apostles, uh, chapter 24, verse 5, uh, where uh, the reference is to Paul, uh, who is on trial uh, before a governor called Felix, and there's an attorney for the... Um, uh, the, the, the people who are bringing charges against him and this man's called Tertullus and he refers to Paul as a ringleader of the sect Hyrasis, interestingly uh, uh, of the Nazarenes that's Orioi uh, so I'm thinking that by the time of the Quran or in the Quran's view the Bnei Yisrael are made up of Yahud on the one hand and Nasara on the other. And that these names are then used for the post-Quranic communities, if you will. Okay, so that little bit having uh, been said, let's look at this uh, extended passage from the Quran. Um, I'll read it very quickly, but perhaps everybody can read it along with me. The scripture people, the Ahl Kitab, uh, will ask you to cause a scripture to come down to them from heaven. They asked of Moses much more than that. They said, show us God manifested. So a thunderbolt struck them for their crime. Then they adopted the calf. After clear signs had come to them, and we pardon them that. Now this we is God speaking in the majestic plural. And often the only way you know uh, who the Ahl Kitab in particular are is in reference to what's mentioned about them. So obviously here we're talking about the Bnei Israel uh, and uh, the subsequent Jewish community. We gave Moses clear authority. We raised over them the mountain for their covenant. We told them to enter the gate, making prostration. We told them not to transgress the Sabbath. And we took a strict covenant with them. And then... Now, obviously, the text is setting up the Jewish community for obloquy here. Okay? And... Um, is uh, alluding to scriptural events that the reader, the audience, would be expected to recognize. There's no quotation. Uh, there's not even an echo. Uh, it's just allusion that the, that the Quran is presuming is unmistakable. And then it gives a list of particulars. And as you go down the list, all the particulars, I've uh, put these bullet points there. And you'll notice that in, a, in the middle, uh, one of them gets expanded. And that's what we're going to be talking about uh, a little more. But anyway, it starts out... <coughs> Uh, notice with all because of all these things and you only get to the conclusion at way down at the bottom where it says we have prepared a sore punishment for the unbelievers among them so that's where the apodosis so to speak comes uh, grammatically speaking 
So, because of their violation of their covenant and their disbelief in God's signs, because of their unjust killing of the prophets, because of their saying, our hearts are uncircumcised. Now you'll notice the little bit in parenthesis here and in italics. That's my manipulation of the text. In other words, I'm suggesting, and uh, we'll have to decide among ourselves whether I'm suggesting it plausibly or not, that we find internal glosses, or uh, as one recent translator of the Quran, actually, uh, Muhammad Abdul Halim, uh, refers to what he calls internal tefsir. Um, uh, occurring at certain junctures. So uh, these are my perceptions now. I don't have any authority for this, please remember. Okay, so um, after they're saying our hearts are uncircumcised, I take it there's this gloss, nay, God put a stamp on their hearts because of their disbelief, so only a few would believe. Then we go on, because of their disbelief and they're uttering a great slander against Mary. Now, what might that be? Well, we can perhaps recall passages, some parts of the Talmud, Toledo, Yesu, places like this, where uh, Mary is held up for a certain obloquy, let's say, uh, polemical uh, remarks. And here we come to the crucial one. And they're saying, we killed the Messiah, Jesus, the son of Mary, the messenger of God. Now, already from the point of view of the Quran's own prophetology, the way it's worded here makes it a manifest absurdity. Uh, but we get to that. Um, then uh, there are these other verses. Uh, they did not kill him. I take it that that's a gloss as well. And then I have some passages in bold italics. I'm suggesting this is a gloss within a gloss. And you may think I'm really going around the bend now. But anyway, uh, and they did not crucify him, but it seemed so to him. This is going to turn out to be a crucial phrase. Uh, and I have a tendentious translation of it here, but it's Welekin uh, uh So we can talk about that uh, in a moment. They had no knowledge of him, only following opinion. They did not, for a fact, kill him. Then it goes on. Rather, God raised him up to himself. God is mighty and wise. Every scripture person will believe in him before he dies. On the day of resurrection, he will be a witness against them. That's the end, it seems to me, of the internal gloss. And uh, then the next bullet point follows. But I'm alleging that um, prior to that passage that I'm thinking of as a gloss, the previous bullet point is, and they're saying we killed the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary. Then it comes to the next one. And then because of crime on the part of those who practice Judaism, then another gloss, we forbade good things to them that had been allowed. And then the final three, because of their abundant turning away from God's path, their taking interest, although it had been forbidden to them, and their wrongly consuming the wealth of people. That's the end of the list of particulars. Then the apotheosis, as it were, we have prepared a sore punishment for unbelievers among them, but those of them, that is, this Al-Kitab, are, who are well-grounded in knowledge, believers who believe in what has been sent down to you, notice second person masculine singular, that's Muhammad, and what was sent down before you, Muhammad again, those who perform prayer, those who give alms, those who believe in God in the last day, to those we will give a mighty recompense. Now, those would be the 
the Bnei Yisrael who so qualify, or the Yahud who so qualify. Now, what has caused the trouble in all of this is uh, the, uh, the phrase in the middle there that I've translated, but it seemed so to them. How should we understand that uh, particular phrase? Uh, on the surface, it seems to me that all the Quran really says here is that while in the Quran's view, the Jews say that they were responsible for the death of Jesus of Nazareth, in fact, they aren't. That this is something that they wrongly claim to be responsible for. I take it that that's all it literally says. Uh, but there are plenty of people who think it says a lot more than that. Um, and it starts very early in the uh, interpretive tradition. So, for example, in uh, uh, the tafsir of, of Mokhat ibn Suleiman already, one of the earliest ones we have, you know, from the 8th century, he's already saying that somebody was substituted for Jesus uh, and that that substitute was the one uh, who was killed and crucified. So he, so he explains why they didn't know. Uh -huh. He explains why they didn't know by, by giving uh, explanation to the cha change of, of a person killed. Well, maybe so, yeah. I mean, later Muslim polemicists, for example, they like to point out the many junctures in the Gospels uh, where it seems Jesus is not recognized by people, sometimes by his own people. And they say, see, uh, there must have been look-alike around. <laughs> uh, and that, that was the guy that was, uh, uh, was crucified. Uh, anyway, that's an interpretation that um, was put on to this verse already in uh, Islamic times, early Islamic times. Now, uh, now I come to uh, the other part in uh, the title for our seminar today, Docetism. How does this get involved with it? Um, uh, Western scholars of the Quran are always looking for subtexts or sources for what's found in the Quran. Sometimes they push it so far that one gets the impression that the author of the Quran couldn't have had an idea of his own but must have found it somewhere else. But uh, that's a little hobby horse of mine I won't ride today. But um, because of the language here, should be had it, in, especially in its sense of, of seeming or being like or uh, resembling, um, it puts people in mind, already very early Muslim commentators, not to mention uh, modern day scholars, of a group of Christians uh, who did think that somehow Jesus of Nazareth really was not the recipient of bodily harm and death, torture and death. Now, uh, these people are often called docetists, obviously from the Greek word uh, dokein, that means something on the order of to seem or seem like or uh, looks like. It's not unlike the shubiha word in, in, in Arabic, actually, in that sense. And many scholars have noticed that in the first third of the seventh century, when Muhammad's career unfolded and the Quran itself came to be, at least orally, it didn't come into writing until 
after the middle of the 7th century. This becomes a very contentious issue about when it came into writing. Um, we can discuss that if people want to be here for a while. Um, but uh, anyway, let's just assume that it came into writing somewhere after the midpoint of the 7th century. There was uh, a group of people, Christian people, among the so-called Jacobite or Monophysite community of Christians, uh, whom their adversary called Aftartodocetists. And at this point, usually most students in my seminar at home start scratching their heads and say, who might they be? Well, uh, the, the Greek term uh, simply suggests that um, that they are people who believe that uh, no physical harm or bodily harm uh, came to the person of Jesus of Nazareth who to all intents and purposes seemed in fact to have been nailed to a cross and to have died. Now, uh, this teaching is normally associated with uh, a teacher called Julian of Halicarnassus. Uh, I know that those participants in the seminar way in the back there uh, have heard of this because uh, David, you've already spoken to them about it, right? Numerous occasions. <laughs> okay. So, um, Julian of Halicarnassus was a theologian. He died around the year 527, so um, a few years before the time of, uh, of Muhammad. He was a colleague of, a, of another early Christian writer and thinker called Severus of Antioch, uh, who for a time, a very short time, was the, the bishop or patriarch of the city of Antioch in Syria. Um, he died in 538, so, um, you know, almost 10 years after Julian. Uh, Severus was really the, um, the intellectual responsible for the, what would become the definitive articulation of the position of the Jacobite communities in terms of Christology, uh, or the so-called uh, Monophysites, or Miaphysites, as they like to be called today, after the, the Greek phrase, Miaphysis, one nature. Um, and uh, so this, this teaching on the part of Julian uh, is almost one could think of it as a further step into the one nature Christology that was rejected by Severus, uh, who gave, as I mentioned, sort of definitive expression to uh, uh, the theological or more correctly Christological view of this community. And um, it's so much so that it's, it's normally called Severan Monophysitism. Okay, enough of that. Um, and it so happens that we know that there were followers of Julian of Halicarnassus who are called Julianists, usually in the sources, particularly the Syriac sources. Uh, we know that they were in Alhira which is in southern Iraq, but was one of the cities on the Arabian periphery that was strongly Christian uh, in the first third of the seventh century. Uh, we know from reports uh, that members of this community uh, were said to be in Najran, uh, which is, as you know, a South Arabian city from which uh, it is reported that uh, representatives came to Medina, to Yathrib, uh, for a conversation with Muhammad. Uh, the conversation did not go well, but uh, 
that's a story for another day. Um, so it's possible that uh, people of this general viewpoint were uh, in the Arabic-speaking milieu, uh, perhaps even in the audience that could possibly have heard Muhammad deliver the words of the Quran in the first place. It's not impossible. The big question is, does that have anything to do with what the Quran says here? and with the meaning of the phrase وَلَكِنْ شُبِهَ اللَّهُ Clearly at some point the connection seems to have been made. But in my view it was made in post-Quranic times by uh, Muslim Mufassirin many of whom seem to have been well aware of a number of strains of thought, both Jewish thought and Christian thought, and of course were charged with the idea of uh, making sense of what the Quran says. Now what about these parts of the text that I'm claiming are um, glosses? and in one instance even a, uh, um, a gloss within a gloss. And you'll notice that the phrase in question, وَلَكِنْ شُبِهَ لَهُمْ occurs in uh, that part of the text that I'm thinking of as the gloss within the gloss. So is it possible that as the Quran was being collected, first of all in the memories of the people who first heard it, I mean we know that collecting, gathering activity was going on already orally, uh, the later texts even say as much, and then there was at some point a process of revision, of uh, editing, of putting together, we don't know much about it. At least, I should be honest, I don't know much about it. Um, but sometimes from the text itself, you get the, the, the hint that, you, that the text itself in some ways, uh, in ways in which one might read it, uh, suggests editing activity of some kind or or uh, adjusting uh, activity of some kind, uh, especially where uh, maybe editors, and this could be prior to the canonization of the Quran, uh, but still in the, uh, uh, the period of Muhammad's lifetime and shortly thereafter, uh, explanatory glosses, internal tefsir, as Abdul Khalim calls it, um, is it possible that some kind of Christian docetist uh, ideas got into the gloss? Everything's possible. But I tend to think it takes special pleading to make that case because uh, it's just I guess my prejudice in the matter, that if it can be explained within the frame of reference of its own text, we shouldn't <coughs> posit uh, a source or an influence that's not needed. Um, and if all it means, I mean, I've, I've given you a prejudiced translation, okay? If, if all it means is it seemed so to them, or that's what they thought they did, uh, then I don't see any need for apfarto docetists. Um, but if uh, can reasonably, reasonably be thought to somehow be reflective of some kind of docetism in the milieu, 
well, then maybe there is such an intrusion. Um, but it's in the gloss. If I'm right that this is a gloss. Um, and so it may be the case that the Quran is saying one thing perfectly in accord with its own theology. Uh, I'll be talking about that particular theology in greater detail tomorrow if you know you want to tune in and, I mean it's almost like a radio serial or something. Um, but um, the Quran's uh, prophetology, as I call it, I think is, is, is very strong. And Jesus is Rasulullah. And uh, in the Quran, the, the only people that are killed and crucified in using that very language uh, are people who oppose God's messengers. So, for example, in Surah 5, Almaida, verse 33, uh, again speaking to the children of Israel and referring to the story of Cain and Abel, the text says, the punishment for those who fight God and his messenger is that they be killed and crucified, the same concatenation of words. Um, so I tend to think we don't need the docetists here and that we shouldn't import them. But that's my position. Uh, so maybe at this point I can say, okay, I've put my cards on the table. What do you think of it? Resounding silence. <laughs> I want to first to ask about this very strange, these two very strange quotations. Uh -huh. Who are those Jews who say, who say, our hearts are uncircumcised, and who say we killed the Messiah? Uh, I don't know who they are. But who, uh, can we imagine I, I, such my, people? I, I, I go around looking for who the Christians might be that say certain things that the Quran reports. Um, but I'm a loss as to whether or not there are uh, any Jews who actually say that. Well, this, I mean, the, the Quran says, quotes Jews saying that. I mean, yeah. This is very strange. What's yeah. your take on that? Well, uh, it could, I, I don't know. I think one would have to imagine that uh, the Quran is aware of some Jewish people uh, who might be thinking of themselves as uh, uh, maybe sinfully uh, non-observant and that therefore are speaking in this way metaphorically. I don't know, it's a guess. Hmm? I, I don't know either, and, and we have very few sources, of course. Now, my question to your, uh, to your hypothesis. Uh, if this Walakin Shubihalaum is in the second gloss, the gloss on the gloss, yeah. it's not in the Ur Quran, but it is in the Quran as it exists at the end of the 7th century. Yeah. And maybe even <laughs> by the middle uh, so, of the century. So, so you have displaced the, the question, but the question remains. Yeah. Well, sure. I mean, I, you, yeah, this, there's still, it's still there in the text and still requires uh, right. so there were, some interpretation. There were people. Now, you mentioned the Aftarodocetists. Yeah. We know that they were in the, how should I say, in the milieu in which Muhammad circulates, because he's, he does circulate. He doesn't stay in, in Arabia. He goes with his uncle on caravans to the north. He, people move from the south, from Najran, 
people come from Palestine and the, the and in Arabia itself, they are refugees, they are monks, they are refugees from Iran, they are dualists. Yeah. There are all kinds of people. That's right. There could also be docetists. That's right. But it I mean, doesn't we, necessarily we, now, mean that he has to be talking about them just because... Not he, but, but, but the gloss. To me, as I say, it's possible. Uh, it depends on what you think it means. Well, I can show you that. If all it means well, is... Well, uh, they thought they killed him, but actually they did not kill him because something happened and he was not killed. Yeah, but that doesn't... And we know exactly what this is. This is docetism. Well, not quite so fast. I mean, uh, if they <laughs> thought they did, but they didn't, that's not yet docetism. It's only becoming docetism if you think it means that... Uh, uh, something else happened. Some something seemingly other happened. I mean, more than just their own thought that they didn't. Well, I ask, for example, the replacement of Jesus with someone else, yeah, dying on the cross, that other guy, it wouldn't be a docetism. Well, that would be substitution. Yeah, that would be substitution. Okay. Yeah. And that's the way some people actually translated this text. Well, that can should be allowed. They, they, they translate it by saying somebody was substituted for him. In other words, there, uh, especially Muslim uh, interpretations of Quran passages, often uh, use that wording. Uh, someone was substituted for him. I take it that that's where exegesis is influencing. Uh, Translation, but the gentleman over here had the. Yeah, can I just make one or two comments? Um, the Nasara, are the Nasara possibly Christian Jews? Uh, oh, I was afraid somebody would bring that. Okay, I'll leave it. 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 Okay. I'll, I'll leave it up. Well, you it's have an ally. I, I, I know nothing about this stuff, obviously. I'm not this here, right? So it's not that I know anything, so don't worry. <laughs> but. but uh, I am. <laughs> you see, well, it, it, your, your first question from over there. The Jews who say, our hearts are not circumcised. Well, okay, this is a New Testament thing to say what matters is the circumcision of the heart, not the circumcision of the body. Right? That comes from the prophets. That comes from. Okay, yeah. it comes from the prophets and it continues with St. Paul. Right? So, if there are Christians, whether they're Jewish Christians or other Christians, who are in some kind of polemic with Jews, they say, we are the people who are circumcised of the heart. But you are The not. Christians say this. Yeah. You people, you are just circumcised of the body. Right? Yeah. And the Jews might respond, we are not these people who say they are circumcised by the heart. It would be a perfectly uh, natural response to distinguish themselves from the people who emphasize mm -hmm. circumcision of the heart. Mm -hmm. So, so it, it, there could be um, Jews who would say that. Sure. Meaning as an attack on the ones who say all that matters is circumcision of the heart. Now, the docetism is not necessary at all that on, on, on the basis of the text. It could even be influenced by a certain interpretation that's almost orthodox Christianity. Right? Uh, think of John's Gospel. Uh, sorry, I haven't got the text here. I can't see it. That's right. The, the, okay. The Quran is against Jews for saying, for claiming that we killed the Messiah. Right? Jesus, the son of Mary. Obviously, normal Jews won't say that Jesus is the Messiah. So these are either Jewish Christians or other Christians. 
saying Jesus is the Messiah. Anyway, they are being accused in the Quran of saying this, that we killed, we killed Jesus. On one hand, you can say, and, and, and then it says, they did not kill him, whether it's a glass or not. Well, actually, you can argue that from the Gospel. The Roman soldiers who killed him. Mm -hmm. huh? I, it wasn't the Jews who killed him. It wasn't the Jews who crucified him. It was the Roman soldiers. You can argue that from John. And you can also argue, so they did not crucify him. It depends where you put the emphasis. They did not kill him. They did not crucify him. It seemed to them it was them. They were disputing about him, and indeed, in doubt about him. They had no knowledge of him. They had no knowledge of him. It might also mean he delivered himself to be crucified, which is what St. John says. Nobody took him. He gave himself up. Right? They, uh, uh, they were only following opinion. That's opinion as opposed to reality, presumably, as in Greek philosophy. Yeah, this is a polemic against Jews here, so... We have to keep that in focus, yeah. And then again, yeah. Okay. They did not kill him for a fact. Uh. So they did not kill him for a fact. That's okay. Even in Orthodox Christianity. Could be. Okay, John has yeah. another has there's two aspects. Yeah, yeah. But it's another thing of you know, as to how much it accords with what Christians actually think or teach. Because I think we have to keep our focus on it's a Quran text here that yeah, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, uh, uh, what I'm saying, oh, oh, okay, I'll leave it if you want, but no, no, no. Well, nobody else seems hurt. to be clamoring for no. it. Yeah, two things, first of all, uh, I think w where it is we killed the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, the messenger of God, uh, is it possible that the terms the Messiah and the Messenger of God are simply put in as honorific uh, statements. Whenever you mention Jesus, Son of Mary, you call him the Messiah, the Messenger of God. You I mean, not that this is intended to be a quotation from people, but uh, b because also when Mohammed is often mentioned, people always add on to it, you know, this this blessing of him and so on and so on. So, on. Yeah. so well. I think th I think that's not necessary. Uh, 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 a reason to see it uh, as coming from Christians, but rather that Mohammed used this honorific title in referring to Jesus anyway. Well, yeah, I mean, that, it, it doesn't come from Christians. It comes actually, th this is the the Quran's uh, mm. typical statement uh, <coughs> of uh, of, uh, of who Jesus of Nazareth yeah, really I mean, it's, is. It's, it's yeah. obvious, it's, uh, see, it's simply that Whenever you sp in the Quran, whenever you speak of him, you have to speak of him in this way. Well, not always. That's the problem. No, but but sometimes I mean, sometimes just the name Isa is mentioned. Sometimes just the name Messiah is yeah. mentioned. No, but but it is tip. It is a. It, a it's yeah. It's the Quran's official mm. statement mm. of mm. who Jesus of Nazareth yeah. is. It's, yeah. it's mm. uh, so it doesn't. This whole it, phrase. Yeah. So it doesn't, it doesn't mean that uh, this, th these terms, Messiah and Messenger of God, are coming, f uh, are really ascribed to somebody saying it, but it's simply rather the, it's rather the Quran's way of reporting. Uh, oh, I think I see what you mean, Malcolm. Yeah. yeah that it's, I, that those, in other words, the, f the presence of those words doesn't, uh, doesn't mean that it's coming uh, from a, from a Christian or from no, it, it, it wouldn't no. come from a Christian. It's the Quran stating what it always states when it's uh, when it's speaking. Well, of say, Jesus what I mean, it, it doesn't mean that it's not quoting something from Jews. The fact that it has terms no. in it, no, no, Be you're right, because yeah. it's simply it's the honorific way in which, yeah. I if you want to talk, do you tell me? Yeah, it, it's what the Quran says mm. about Jesus. It yeah. says that mm. he's the Messiah, the yeah. Son of Mary. Uh, uh, Rasulullah, mm -hmm. that's his main yeah. characterization in mm -hmm. the Quran. And in one place, in fact, a little bit later in this surah, in mm -hmm. fact, verse 171, it says that he's Kalimatullah, mm -hmm. wa ruhun minhu, mm -hmm. uh, of God, that is, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. 
so it, it gets more complicated. <laughs> but 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 basically, I take the point. Yeah. yeah. But the second second point is this: that the Shubha yeah. uh It's possible to imagine alternative meanings of that. And I will give one, which I don't say it's connected with it, because it obviously isn't, but, uh -huh. but which has occurred to other people in a similar situation. Uh -huh. uh, and that is the question of whether Helen was abducted by Menelaus or not. Oh. <laughs> because uh, the, in the, the, the Greek mythological tradition, uh -huh. there are two versions. One is that he took away... He took that. It's not Mendes. Brother uh, Paris took Paris. away men, the wife. Yeah, one is that he did in fact take her, and the other one is that the gods created an image of her, who he took, yeah. and the real Helen actually went to Egypt to and spent the whole the time Spanish. of the Trojan War in Egypt, yeah. and that it was only a phantasm that uh, was taken to Troy by Paris. Well, yeah, uh, and so curiously, by the way, in, in Pedocles, he has both versions. In in the, in in the, the women of Troy, uh, it, it's the real Helen, and in his Helen, it, it's uh, it, you know it, the real Helen yeah. went to Troy, yeah. and in his Helen, it's the Helen who's in Egypt, and is who while the, the phantasm is somewhere, and she's yeah. suffering in Egypt, uh, and be, while while the, you know, and so. Yeah. So uh, it would be possible for someone to say that it was only a phantasm. That's of right. Christ. In fact, another that was name for the Aftartodosites yeah. is phantasiasts. Yeah, but, uh, a, fant a phantasm which was crucified yeah. and not. Uh, you know. Yeah, but that's. Uh, yeah, uh, it it still it, it, it widens the interpretive yeah. potential. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> except except that we have. Early Christian texts, yes. Gnostic texts, yes. if we can call them Christian, uh, Christian mm -hmm. yes. heterodox texts, which yes. describe precisely that. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's right. Uh, but those are texts from a much earlier period, and well, we're in danger of getting into a territory that you know well. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that um, uh, uh, the question becomes. Uh, just because you can find that, say, in a third century text, mm. it's kind of a jump to suppose that it got into this seventh century Arabic Muslim text. Um, and then, in order to explain that, one postulates the presence of a group, you know, yeah. otherwise unattested in the uh, desert wastes of Arabia who hold this view. So, Except if there are good, other good reasons to know that such a group was in existence at the time. Uh, I, we I, disagree I, here. I, I know you would disagree with me, that, yeah. but I, 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 I'm trying to be... Uh, yeah. okay. uh, I, I said two more questions, and let's take them, and they'll have to be brief and to the point, sorry. because I think six is our oh. bewitching hour. So, Merab, and then Joe, you also indicated, so... Okay, my, um, my question is about 171. Um, you may have talked about it on Sunday, and I sadly missed it, but um, about the Trinity reference. Um, and I, I was wondering if um, you know that it's, it plays a very major role in Jerusalem. Um, yeah. In Jerusalem, inscribed ah. on the door yeah, of yeah, the rock. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and I was wondering how much polemic um, with Christianity is manifested um, in inscriptions like this mm -hmm. elsewhere, and I think you might be the only person who could answer this question. <laughs> well, I'm, I don't know um, of other inscriptions in other places where these Quranic verses or parts of Quranic verses uh, are displayed, but you find lots of references in texts, okay, but in, if, if you remember in uh, Surah An-Nisa, verse 171, uh, all these terms are, are referred um, uh, to Jesus himself. You know, we, we think of them as, as Trinitarian terms, but the Quran is framing them as Christological terms. 
you know, so if you, if you just uh, look at 171 real quickly, you know, where it says, O oh, people of the book, so again, you don't know who this is going to be until you see what they say, what it says about him. And don't go into excess in your religion, and don't say about God anything but the truth. And then it says, the Messiah, Jesus, Mary's son, uh, the messenger of God, and his word that he put into Mary, and a spirit from him. So... The text is uh, saying this about Jesus, okay? And then it goes on after that, of course, to say, um, believe in God and his messengers. Don't say three. Stop it. You know, so we know what three he's talking about. And uh, so we've got, a, but it, the, the way I read it, the text says, Allah, I mean, uh, Esau, um, is both Rasulullah, Kelimatullah, and we find that phrase in other places in the Quran, and it's always Kelimatullah, not Kalamullah. Okay, so Kelimatullah, and uh, minhu, and a spirit from him. Jesus is these things. So, rhetorically, polemically, um, this is accounting for what the Christians think of as Trinitarian terms as Christological terms. You know, so uh, it's a pretty neat polemic. Of course, the early Christian apologists who wrote in Arabic, then always, almost every one that you can think of, then turned around and quoted this verse saying that you've got the Trinity right in the Quran. Allah and uh, uh, the Kalimatullah and the Ruchun Minhu. Yeah, voila. <laughs> Joe? Yeah. Uh, my, I apologize up front. This might be somewhat anticlimactic at the point of clarification. Okay. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I'm just curious of the, the maybe the assumption of intertextuality behind the question that you're asking or behind the hypothesis you're asking. Um, is the argument that this language originated in these docetic circles? Uh, or, or I should say, and or, that the author is consciously paying heed to those? Because those are not necessarily the same thing. Something could originate, the language could originate in a particular community and then lose all associations at a yeah. later period or get brought into the larger idiomatic landscape without those original associations still present? Yeah, I don't think that um, that the that the phrasing in the surah requires any reference to the Aftar to docetists. Um, but if because of the various possibilities of the meaning of the phrase well, I can should be allowed, uh, would prompt you to look for something, then I think uh, that it would not be a matter of intertextuality because I don't see much textuality or intertextuality in the Quran at all. Uh, I, if you're taking text literally to mean uh, something written, now, is it possible to have an oral text? Well, some people say it's a contradiction in terms. Other people say, well, of course, you can have an oral text because we use the word text to mean a narrative of some kind or an account of some kind. But, uh, so I don't think it would, if one w w thinks that this requires that kind of an explanation, to me, it would be that these would be things that were known to be said uh, in the milieu, and I think the Quran knows what Christians say and polemicizes against what Christians say. And this would not be a difficult thing to learn. I mean, uh, what do they say? And if there were people who were saying that it only seemed like Jesus was killed and crucified on the cross, um, well, uh, 
then uh, if if you're prepared to think that it's because of that that this language occurred in the Quran, then it would be that way, hearsay, more or less. So uh, it's an intentional allusion to the Docetic tradition. Yeah, or the, yeah, the, this Docetic thing that the Christians say. I mean, I don't want to turn the Quran or Muhammad into a virtual late antique theologian, you know, who knows all about the Christological controversies <laughs> and things like that. Although I think he he was aware, or or the Quran was aware of the Christological controversies, and I really think that the Quran uh, is uh, making its own contribution uh, to uh, the argument about who is Jesus of Nazareth. Um, it's very aware of what's going on. You find these hints everywhere in the Quran, uh, not just in this place. But of course, the other side, it's not true. I mean, I don't know of any first third of the seventh century uh, Syriac, Greek, or other text that seems to know what's going on in, in uh, Mecca, Medina. But um, the Arabic speakers in Mecca, Medina seem to be well aware of what's going on in a general fashion, mm -hmm. not in a... Uh, they know that the Christians are arguing with one another about what's the right thing to say about Jesus of Nazareth? Who is he? Okay. Yeah, I like very much your suggestion about Julian. Ah. But uh, what do we know about the impact of Julianism at that period? That's a very good question. Um, and it gets complicated. There's no lack of reference in uh, Syriac texts, especially by Jacob of Sarug and, uh, oh yeah, yeah, I'm going to have a senior moment now. Um, well, uh, I'm sorry, I just can't recall the name. Uh, they're writing about the Christians of Madran, you know, and uh, the martyrs of Madran, as they refer to them. And it's in this context that Jacob of Sarug in a letter and uh, uh, the other uh, man, uh, inshallah, it might come to me, uh, his name, make reference to the Julianists there. And, and you find it in, in other texts like Philoxenus of Mabub, uh, you know, talking. And then as late as, uh, as, as Jacob of Edessa, you, you find references to, uh, to the Julianists. But here's the thing. References to, to, to heresiarchs uh, does not necessarily mean the presence of that heresiarch or his followers uh, in the place where the name is mentioned because these names tend to be not only historical references but theological labels. Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, you can call somebody an Arian uh, long after there were no Aryans. I mean... Uh, uh, Messalian. Huh? Or Messalian. Or Messalians, yeah. yeah. They, so these, these, these names, they, they take on uh, a power beyond the, his, the historical. Of course. You know, somebody could stand up today and say that uh, in our congregations, most of our people are functional Aryans. Now, uh, that doesn't mean that there's... <laughs> any actual Aryans around, you know, um, except maybe theologically. <laughs> so. Should be. Thank you. Really, thank you. If I could just close by saying, spending time with Professor Griffith, and, and particularly perhaps in an intimate, although we're perhaps a little bit beyond the numbers of being truly intimate, but nevertheless intimate setting um, is a reminder that humane learning is not a, just a matter of quantity and not even a matter of quality, but it's the way one, I guess you'd say, bears and shares that learning with us. And uh, it truly is an experience of being in the presence of humane learning. Sidney, thank you very, very much. Yes, sir. You're welcome. Just a very quick reminder, as people gather their things in exit,
that this second seminar, the final seminar, will be given tomorrow afternoon. That's Wednesday, tomorrow, at 4, at 4.30 in the afternoon, back in the Humanities Building, room 5318, the seminar room of the Institute of Asia, Africa, room 5318 at 4.30, on the Sunnah of our Messengers, exploring the Quran's revisionist prophetology.